Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Intelligent Automation in Local Government webinar. Um, my name is Ian McGregor. Next slide, please. Um, I am responsible for the um, public sector business for UiPath, and together, UiPath and T Impact uh, bring um, with to you a series of three webinars on uh, automation, predictive process automation in local government robotic process automation local government um, we've got a full 45 minutes so i will um, go through the agenda and then we'll kick off next slide please um, this is the second in the series of three the last um, webinar we did we talked about what is automation uh, robotic process automation I will recover that, but then we're going to talk about how that moves forward, how you actually maximize, optimize your investment in automation to get the maximum out of it. Then um, we'll do that a few minutes, and then we're going to pass over to Linda from Decorum Borough Council, who's going to talk about how they've their RPA journey and how they've centralized their approach uh, to their RPA implementation and rollout. Then we're going to um, then Keith from T Impact is going to talk about some of the lessons that uh, both T Impact and organisations have learnt by going through our RPA journey, their RPA journeys. And then we're going to have a Q&A session and then we're going to finish and say in 45 minutes or so. A couple of housekeeping requests, if I may. If you have any questions, there is a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Can we ask you to put your questions in the Q&A box, uh, not in the chat? but in the Q&A box, and we'll go through as many of those at the end of the presentation as we can. And I should state that this presentation is being recorded and it will be made available soon after the end of the webinar. Right, last week we talked about what is RPA, and just to recover, RPA, repetitive process, robotic process automation, is um, the automation of repetitive rules-based processes that organizations do. These processes in their own right, can be fairly quick and can be fairly cheap. It's things like cutting and pasting. But when an individual does tens or hundreds or thousands a day and there are tens or hundreds of thousands of people doing the same sort of process, it really adds up. And RPA has now been out for four or five years. The benefits are well proven, well documented. They include speed, accuracy, uh, compliance, accountability, increased employee satisfaction, in, increased citizen uh, interaction and satisfaction and cost. So we talked all about last, that last week. But RPA, implementing robots, is not like implementing, installing a finance system. It's not a one-off task. Uh, next slide, please. It is a journey. It is a uh, work, it is a cycle, a repetitive cycle that you go through that you need to, in order to maximize any investment, any time, any money you put, that you actually do it correctly and that you get the results and you learn from the results. So there is a life cycle that you have to go through. And all you see on the screen now are the various stages of that life cycle. Firstly, you have to identify, well, actually, what processes are we going to automate? Which ones are right for automation? And how are you going to select that? What's the criteria that you're going to select? Is it complexity is it the cost of the automation is it speed is it compliance is it the number of people involved is it the back office systems that are in use how do you actually select which processes are to be automated and then how do you prioritize those and how do you measure what that current situation is with those processes at this point in time and it might not be just processes a process can be something quite large like Accounts payable is a process, but within the process, there are tasks. Is it better to automate some tasks and not others? Which are the best tasks to automate? So then you have to, so you have to discover where we're going to concentrate initially our automation, what we're going to automate. And then you have to build. And the quicker you can build it and the more accurately you can build it, and if you can reuse any components that you've used already, you've built already to make it more efficient, that's, that's the best way to move forward. Let's reuse, let's build quickly then you want to deploy it we want to deploy it in an optimum way when is it best for these robots to run it might be based on the availability of data from the existing feeders legacy systems uh, 
you know, it might be based on people being available to manage exceptions. So how do you actually deploy and manage the robots once you've, once you've built them? Then you run them and actually what type of robots do we want to run? Are they front office attended robots or are they back office unattended robots? What's the best mix? Is it a mixture of both? And any automation itself, is it purely 100% robots or are you going to involve humans in the loop somewhere? Are you going to have a process which starts to be automated using a robot, but then it needs to hand over to a human for an input or a validation and then needs to hand, then hand back to a robot to complete? Or for another example, humans in the loop, what about customers? Are they going to interact, citizens, are they going to interact with your environment through chatbots and if so how do we pick up and when do we pick up the interaction from the chatbots so how do we engage people into this automation as well and the final thing i'll say is that's all great but then how do we measure what we've done as being successful do we know what benefits we've accrued what are the kpis how regularly do we measure the kpis and once we have that data then we need to feed it back to the beginning of the life cycle in order to actually make amendments, make adjustments and carry on the improvement process. But what I will say, RPA is a journey. It is not a single installation, as I mentioned before. Once you install robots and they start doing some really good work and the word gets about, you'll be surprised how quickly people in other departments, other business owners start to think up ideas for automation for themselves. So at that point, then you want to start feeding those back into the discovery section, do the qualification on those, are they right for automation? If so, you know, how are we going to do it? And then the, the, the whole life cycle begins again and expands and expands and expands. And at that point, you then go into what's called hyper automation mode. So you're starting to automate as much as possible, as efficiently and as quickly as possible, and you're starting to measure the output and gain benefits as rapidly as possible. And it's an iterative process, not a one-off implementation and walk away. It continues and it grows and it grows and it grows. That's what hyper automation is. Next slide, please. So what you need, obviously, is different tools for different phases of that life cycle, that hyper automation life cycle. And uh, obviously coming from UiPath, I will say here and now, I have a vested interest in telling you that we have different tools to do different parts of that life cycle. For example, in the discovery phase, we have tools which will actually measure the whole process end to end, but also measure the systems the legacy feeder systems, how they interact. Uh, are there any duplicate redundant steps that the systems do? And then we can take it down to tasks. What are the tasks that people do? You know, can we measure the tasks that they do? Can we look into detail about anything that they're doing that's redundant? Then when we gather all that data, we want to store it in a single place. And we want to start creating graphs and charts. And we want to store all the information about those processes in a single place that everybody can refer to. So we've got the initial data. Then from that data, we then want to start building. We want to start using different tools. Are they RPA developers who are going to do the building? Or can we handle, hand some of the development out to the business owners? Obviously, they know the processes. They may not be that technically savvy, but they can make a good start. So there are tools that allow business processes to get involved as well. And then you, once you've built them, you want to then deploy them do we deploy them to the cloud deploy them on premise and i'll talk about that in a minute or do we and how do we actually roster when these automations take place what's the input is it a time is it a factor is it an email what's going to actually make these automations kick off and then as i said before what sort of robots do we want to run them against are they robots that act to interact with a human and they're on the human's laptop and then enable uh, a human to work more effectively or, or efficiently or do they just run in the background um, permanently and then when there's problems they kick out exception reports that people um, pick up and, and, and resolve or do they actually run a, pro a process like an HR onboarding process where a lot of it's automated you bring in the CV the personal details from applying online but then a human needs to do a right to work check for example that's a human so the automation stops hands over to the human the human then picks it up 
and then carries on. So you're starting now to involve not just the robots, but the people as well. And then you start to, that's internally, then you want to start externally facing to your citizens, to your clients. You want them to engage. So you start to get them to do it digitally through chatbots or online applications and start robot, robots start picking all that up. And the beauty of that is not only is it quicker often for the, for the humans, but everything is recorded. There's an audit trail and everything that happens. And that's all very well and good. But then you have to measure, well, actually, was all this work, all this investment we've made, was it worthwhile? What is the current situation? What are the metrics that we're measuring? What are the KPIs now compared to at the beginning before we started the automation process? So again, there are, there are analytical tools that we can provide that actually go towards measuring and letting you continually feed back and continually improve the automations that you're performing at this point in time. And say so it's round and round and round and improving, improving, improving all the times. So from a, from a technical solution perspective, UiPath has the tools to help you at any or all stages of your hyper automation journey. Next slide, please. However, one of the questions you do want to decide is actually how you're going to deploy your, your automation, how you're going to deploy your robots and your orchestration. Do you want to do it all on premise? Do you want to do it in a, your own private cloud? Do you want to use a public cloud? Do you want to use UiPath's automation cloud? All these options are available and all have pros and cons that are relevant to your business um, and that we can help you decide. But at the end of the day, what you're trying to achieve is the most effective, efficient way of automating as many processes as you can, repetitive rules-based processes, and measuring what those benefits are of going through this. When you do a, when you apply to your business holders, your stakeholders, your you know the finance people for the for the money, you need to be able to measure coming back that yes, we achieved what we set out to do. And so that's the, the whole hyper automation is about measuring and improving in a continual cycle loop, if you like. So that is the hyper automation side. That is me talking. And I, and I wanted to just stop that there because I want to now come on to talk to, um, pass it over to a customer. Linda from Decorum is going to talk about how that, that their automation journey and how they've used a centralized approach at this point in time. So welcome, Linda. Um, I'm gonna pass over to you now, thank you. Linda, are you on mute? Thanks, Ian, I thought someone was going to unmute me. <laughs> Um, hi, my name's Linda and I'm from Decorum Borough Council. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, as I said, uh, I'm the Assistant Director for People, Performance and Innovation for Decorum Borough Council. And uh, I'm here today to talk about how we hope to deliver RPA benefits across the council through a centralised programme. Just a little bit about me to start off with. Um, I joined uh, Decorum nearly two years ago after a career with private sector organisations supporting public sector clients. Um, this is the first time for me that I've been directly employed by a local authority. And I think the main reason why I joined was to lead on the development and implementation of a change uh, programme uh, that's working across the council, including technology, cultural and leadership development. So it's the, the, the full scope, which is why I've got quite a broad portfolio. Um, next slide, please. So Decorum Borough Council is one of 10 district councils in Hertfordshire. Um, and um, it's uh, actually one of the, uh, um, the largest in terms of uh, number of people that are there. The first question that most people ask is what's decorum because no one's ever heard of the title but actually it was it's a Latin term bought by the Romans um, and I'm, I'm sure you're well aware that there was a Roman settlement in and around St Albans who are our neighbours so that's how we got the title of decorum. 
Um, the main town is Hemel Hempstead with about 150,000 residents and we've got uh, two smaller towns within our catchment area of Berkhamstead and Tring. Uh, but believe it or not, we've got um, about 80% uh, percent of our uh, area is deemed rural with 60% in the, uh, the green belt. So it's a real mix. It's got a very stable leadership. Um, we've had 22 years for the same leader and the same deputy leader which is very helpful in some areas, but it does make them fairly risk uh, averse. Um, so there's a degree of stability that they don't really want to rock the boat, so to speak. Um, so actually um, going through change and getting them to do change can be quite tough, um, but they've certainly now seen the, um, the importance of doing that. We're a standard sort of two second tier um, council with all of the, the, the uh, services you would expect to be provided, apart from obviously adult social care and children's, which are provided by Hearts County Council. But one thing that we do have that not all district councils have is that we've retained our housing stock. So we've got over 10,000 homes within our housing stock. So that's a rather large part of our business. Next slide, please. So it's important to put RPA in terms of the context uh, and what it can do for you. And um, in terms of some of the challenges that we're facing, uh, the first one is really uh, an output from uh, the sort of 10 years of austerity. And that's the fact that we need to improve our productivity on our existing resource. Uh, as I'm sure most of you have been through various different programs and restructures and reorganizations to remove costs from the business, um, we've now got to a stage where I believe, as far as people are concerned, we're very, very lean. Um, we've now got to find other ways to actually do the work. And what we we'll hope, what we we'll think will happen is that even before COVID-19, we expected an increase in demand for services because of the way that the economies were starting to, to run globally. But now because of COVID-19, we expect to see a kind of a tsunami of demand in terms of our services as uh, the impact of, of the uh, pandemic hits uh, local economies. Um, I needed to be able to prove te the technology can work before major investments are made. Again, it, it comes back to their sort of risk averse view. Um, so they don't want to commit to lots of money before they can see that it will actually work. Again, some battle scars, I think, from some poor implementations of other major systems in the past. And one thing that I thought was important was to make sure that we get um, a core technology that's adopted across the council rather than each service doing their own thing, which has happened in other areas, which causes all kinds of problems down the path in terms of providing support, et cetera. So we really wanted to focus on, on just trying to get one technology. Next slide, please. So what we've done is created a new normal program. Um, I am definitely going to change the name because new normal means something else now post uh, the pandemic. Um, but in essence, what it was about is introducing an approach to both change management and continuous improvement. Um, it's really focused in four different areas, uh, systems and processes, people, leadership and partners and relationships. Um, and we focused on those based on feedback from things like the LGA reviews, peer reviews that we've done, as well as um, surveys with staff and members, etc. The main areas that we've looked to develop um, in our first sort of phase has been uh, looking at member development and people, um, but then in particular looking at technology and what that can do to, to help us move forward. Um, we're doing a number of pilots, RPA is one of, the, one of them, but we've also been looking at um, uh, uh, business process re-engineering and some data analytics, as well as looking at our overall strategic direction for IT and particularly some back office services. Um, and um, all of that has enabled us to decide that we wanted to go down the RPA route. And if you go to the next slide, please, what we did is um, we actually ran a competitive tender to try to identify a partner. 
And we thought this was really important because what we didn't want to do was have to go out to tender for every single component part of, of doing an RPA. We wanted to go through the tender so that we can award um, up to the maximum value allowed before you go out to OG, which I think is 160 something grand. But it meant that within that envelope, we wouldn't have to keep going out to market. Um, it was worth the investment because what we then did is, uh, as we went to tender and we got responses, it enabled us to um, find a partner that we could work with, that we thought that understood us, could see what we wanted to achieve and could see some of the challenges we were facing. And um, I'm very pleased to say that we uh, selected T-Impact um, as they were able to see that, as well as having experienced in this before, they really were able to work with us to see how we could actually take this further. And what we've done is to, um, we, we asked to see if we could develop two proof of concept projects um, and actually took the time to invest in um, council-wide awareness workshops, including the, the chief officers group, the CMT and the leadership team to make everyone aware of what this potential opportunity for improvements in uh, productivity could be. So um, T-Impact were able to deliver us actually three uh, proof of concepts projects uh, and we put one in production because uh, there was an opportunity to see some early benefits. Um, what we're now doing is looking at um, documenting the uh, benefit analysis um, and actually looking at uh, getting further commitment to now how we can turn the, the pilots into live uh, systems, so to productionize them into a live environment, and then starting to look at what other processes we would seek to automate. Next slide, please. So what are the things that we've automated? Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about um, each of them. Um, the first one is to do with our environmental services team in particular, who use, um, we have a central um, deployed uh, document management system called Information at Work. Um, and it is quite clunky. It's certainly not one of the new generation of document management systems. And it can be quite um, time consuming for every document that's involved within a case uh, to be attached into the relevant folders. Um, and consequently, what that means is some of the information is not there and is missing. And what that does is it means that it takes a lot of time for people to manage um, cases when they go to review or to court or we get um, uh, requests for information. Um, and it's just about trying to find what we've already got. Um, through the analysis, we've identified that um, potentially we could get new revenue of about 24,000 a year. And that's because people won't be having to search through files to find things or to do other things. Um, they'll be able to use this to go out and do fee pay and work that these guys do, such as pest control. The cost avoidance is particularly important. And this is to do with the fact that we can um, if we do have to go to court, there's all of the uh, court costs in terms of trying to be able to find information and to improve what we do. And the final bit was about improving efficiency. And this is also an, um, something about improving retention, because um, what we have found, uh, as I'm sure all of you have, that there is a bit of a demand on environmental health officers even before the pandemic. Um, and because our clunky systems were so um, uh, annoying uh, for people to use, um, they could be uh, seek to go to work for another organisation if they felt that they could, their, their actual working environment was better. Our um, experience of RPA is that the individual people at the, um, at the coalface, so to speak, really get it and are really enthusiastic once they can see what it can be done and how it can take some of the really repetitive, boring work that they have to do and take that out to enable them to do other things. The next one is in our housing uh, area. And when we moved from the old um, uh, uh, complex of buildings that we had in Hemel Hempstead, we've gone into a, a, a brand new building called the Forum. And as part of that, we um, didn't take all of the filing with us um, and some of our old housing data was put onto microfiche. 
Um, some of the um, cases that we have inside housing when there are disputes need to go back right the way to when original tenancies were taken out, which can be many, many years ago. And what's happened there is that uh, some of this data was on microfiche and it wasn't actually being used. So we were having problems um, and there were a, a number of areas where there were disputed cases at court, etc. So what's happened now is that the, the robot has actually managed to file um, about 25,000 records into our housing system called Orchard. And there's a little flag on it which makes it clear to people that if it's come from microfiche and I can confirm that already we've seen this benefit because um, there's been a couple of cases that have been in dispute that they've now been able to look out for more data and they can see we've now got data that's been used that's been loaded from that microfiche. Um, so it's, it's really that significance here is on the cost avoidance um, because um, certainly um, what you don't want to do is to um, not have your complete data set when going to court. It's avoiding us um, uh, having sort of reputational damage and legal costs. Um, and it's also helping with the enormous amount of uh, time that's spent in preparing for those cases. Uh, the final uh, two uh, robots are to do with finance. So there's no additional new revenue here shown because it's a purely back office function, um, but it is making life easier for them. Um, one is to load and import, import uh, invoices with or without purchase orders, and another to code utility bills to certain cost codes. Um, certainly, uh, these will help uh, in terms of the loading of invoices, avoid late payments, penalties, and avoid overpayments to make sure that we're actually paying what we should and when. And also it helps with the uh, reducing the amount of queries we get from suppliers about why have we not paid something because we're actually getting them into the system in a more timely manner. And the utility bills, as I'm sure most of you've got a very large um, estate with many different properties, um, we get utility bills and they need to be coded to the right cost code so that the utility bills match up with the areas. So that gives you a summary of the, the things that we've been looking at. As you can see, um, we, we're nearly there. We're ready for final playback, uh, two out of the three, and one's actually gone live. Um, and then we'll be taking this to the um, program board. Um, and hopefully then that will mean that we'll move into uh, uh, production environment. Uh, and then we start to think about what's next. Um, next slide, please. So what have we learned from all of this? Um, I think one of the key learnings is that um, RPA is a good way to take waste out of processes and systems. It really is um, a, a, a no-brainer really for think some of the really um, archaic ways in which some of our systems have worked. Um, and it's the real drudge type work that people have to do that um, and, and it causes them they're not necessarily as accurate as they should be if it's a really repetitive task. I do think we've benefited from centralising the pilot of the technology um, because it's encouraged the adoption of the same tool set. Um, I would think it would make life very complicated if you had multiple tools um, to, to, to do this. So um, that's, that's worked. Um, what, how we funded all of this, and again, I think this is also a problem, is that we we used uh, um, our um, technology uh, and change reserves uh, to actually get the funding to do this. It took us quite some time because you've got to go through the process of taking things to scrutiny and cabinet and getting all of the final approval. Um, but it did give us an opportunity to um, tell people what we were uh, planning to do. And also it means that, that no individual service has to take all of the risk um, in case something doesn't actually work out. Um, as I said before, we did have a long list um, and we had some others that are that from when we identified the, the ones that we've done. However, I think because of COVID-19, some of our processes have changed um, in respect to people being able to work from home. And it may well be now that we actually want to change um, and there may be some other processes that are more relevant that we would prefer to do sooner rather than later. 
Um, and how would I have done things differently? Um, it would have been great to have a budget defined up front. Um, it would have meant that we could have deployed this much quicker. Um, but actually doing the way that we have done it has mean, meant that both um, members and also the, the leadership team across the organisation are fully aware of what we're doing and, and supportive of it. Um, next slide, please. So that's, um, that's a story from Decorum, um, and I'm going to hand over to Keith now, who, uh, and it's Keith and his team that have been really helping us through this process uh, um, with the people inside T-Impact. Thank you, Linda. Um, Ian, Linda, great presentations. Um, let's go on to the next slide, please, Karen. Um, because RPA is sometimes perceived as a technology solution, we find that many of our customers really tend to focus on the configuration and coding work. Um, but the traditional software development lifecycle is only about a third of the work for, for delivering a, a, an RPA project. So when we were preparing these lessons learned uh, to share with you, we wanted to really uh, make sure that we covered each of the key activities. Um, and, and these lessons are based on our experiences working with dozens of customers since 2006 when we did our first RPA project. And, and, we, um, uh, uh, and we, we pulled together a bit of information about the relative effort to give you an idea about uh, how you should be planning your projects as well. Uh, next slide, please. So as far as the relative effort, we, uh, th there's about 45% of the effort is in change management. We broke out the, the, the traditional change management activity from the, from the benefits. Um, as, as Linda uh, described very eloquently there, it, it's really important to get these, these benefits right and it takes more effort than you generally uh, anticipate. About 30% of the effort is what you would generally think of as software, de software delivery, you know, your uh, um, analysis, design, development, test, and implementation. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so everyone knows that you need sponsorship to get projects off the ground, um, but the key to really great implementation is building support right across the board, focusing on collaboration, iteration, and a pe people-centric approach. Next slide, please. There, there are a number of uh, a very good change management uh, programs for building sponsorship and team support, but we really uh, tend to borrow most of our, our, our principles from Cotter's change management theory. Um, we, we start off by making sure that the collaboration approach addresses the needs and the fears of the, the stakeholders, and we're particularly talking about the executives that are responsible for allocating the resources, whether that be uh, people, money, or access to, to data. The department team leaders, the ones who really understand in, in a broad brush what their departments do and why it's important and have the, generally the long history of where things have worked and where they haven't worked, and these are the guys that can really uh, 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 verify any, any, any benefits because they're close enough to the frontline staff. And then the frontline staff themselves who understand on a day-by-day -day ba basis what actually happens. You know, how, how does the process work when everything goes well, but uh, uh, which is generally about 80% of the time, you know, using Pareto's law, but that 20% of the time when it doesn't work, what are the variety of things that can happen? Because you, you want to make sure that you have all that understanding. So uh, borrowing from Carter, we really focus on building a sense of urgency building quick wins to uh, uh, demonstrate value, to hold up a case and win the, win the hearts, get people to really, something to rally behind, and then focusing on communication and empowerment. You know, just communicate, 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 and thinking about the audience and what they need to understand in order to, uh, uh, to, to get, build their buy-in and support for the project. Next slide, please. Um, the second lesson learned I wanted to pick up was around the benefits, um, defining work bef uh, benefits before work begins and actually using it to motivate the, the, all stakeholders, not, not just the executive, but the people on the ground as well. It can be used to actually help you drive the decisions throughout your process. You know, should, should we include this feature or not? It's going to increase the cost. Well, what benefit is it? Is it going to contribute to our benefits or not? It can also help us to make those uh, design decisions as we're going through. So, but Defining these benefits can be like walking a tightrope. You, you need enough benefits to, uh, uh, to make you relevant for, for executives, you know, to actually put your, put your project on the table, but you need to be careful that it doesn't ostracize your, your, your heads of departments and your teams because they're not going to want their budget slashed um, uh, for something for uh, a project that solves one problem, but they may have lots of other problems that they need to deal with. So finding that balancing act 
that's good, good for all, it can be quite tricky. Um, and of course, um, if there's a focus on the financial benefits, there's a risk that you don't focus enough on your, on, on, you know, who the service is for, which is, you know, your citizens or your customers, whichever term you use in your council. So a little bit of work on, on voice of the customer, we usually un under some really valuable benefits um, uh, that shouldn't be overlooked. We find that um, as a, when you're introducing the first projects for a new technology require business cases stand up to intense scrutiny. And, and I think Linda mentioned that again, um, distinguishing between hard and soft benefits can often make a difference between whether or not your uh, business case uh, uh, influences people or not. So really understanding the hard benefits that affect your, your bottom line of your profit and loss statement versus soft benefits that can be really important, but sometimes harder to quantify. Next slide, please. Um, I just included a few benefit categories here. What we've done, we take these benefit categories and we've worked a, a developed a questionnaire. It helps us to go around and actually gather information from typically department team leads, but also execs and frontline staff to, to help start building out the logic behind the business case before we start to, uh, attaching numbers to it. Next slide, please. Um, and the last of the, uh, oh, sorry, not uh, next to the last of the lessons learned was really about using RPA where it's suitable um, and then complement it where it's appropriate. So RPA is a really powerful tool. It has so many uses. It's such a, 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 a flexible tool that can allow you to achieve some great results, but it's not the tool for every job. So you really need to make sure that you understand where it's suitable and where it's not. And where it's not suitable, what can you do to the process to make it suitable? Or is it just not a good use? Next slide. So when you think about where you use to use RPA, um, RPA is a piece of automation, so it needs to be rule-based. So you need to be able to embed the, the uh, standard rules. Those rules could be quite complex, but, but they need to be de definable. It needs to be a standard process. It can have lots of different use cases and lots of different flows through it, but you need to be able to predict what those are so you can build them in. <clears throat> and it's best if it's repetitive, because if it's only run once, or, or there are some processes only run once a year, and make it worthwhile, but they run a bunch of times in that once a year. So in order to get the return on investment, you, you, you probably want a process that's repetitive. And robots need structured digitized data. So uh, they, they, uh, the RPA suite is really powerful. You can extract information out of scanned documents, emails. We're building a solution now that's uh, communicating via uh, reading and, and, and communicating via WhatsApp and other social media platforms are, are perfectly feasible, um, but it does need to be digitized. Um, it's particularly effective, and this is really the sweet spot, the spot to look for, where accuracy is critical. So we've done some robots for the NHS where life or death, uh, it's a life or death uh, 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 patient, sorry, it's patient data that getting it right is the difference between life and death. So accuracy is really critical there. So robots are, are quite good. And then where you see staff rekeying between different systems or between spreadsheets and systems or different spreadsheets, uh, you should really focus on that as a good spot to really look, look for an opportunities with RPA. Next slide, please. Where RPA can be challenging. Now, some of this, uh, some of these challenges can be overcome by reviewing your process. As I uh, put in the footnote, you can't see. Uh, so you, you can improve your process to make it more RPA friendly. But the things you want to look out for is where you have a non-standard process or discretionary decision making. So if you have a sales director that's dealing with customer complaints and depending on his mood and whether the sun's out, he gives a credit or he doesn't give a credit, there's, there's no basis for making that de decision uh, uh, that you could automate. So you couldn't automate it with any technology um, uh, and, and RPA is no different. Where it requires empathy or there's a complex interpretation of the context. So there might be somebody who is um, in, in a very complicated social need and you might not want to turn that over to robot. You want, might want to have a human involved in the loop at that stage to do that particular activity. But robots are really good at gathering the information and presenting it across. Where you need to interpret complex graphical images. Uh, so it's not very good for things like aircraft control systems or it's lots of moving graphics. That's not really what they're designed for. And, and the last thing is where your underlying IT system or the environments they sit on isn't stable and changes frequently or, or unpredictably. Next, please. Where you might want to consider complementing uh, uh, RPA um, is uh, with, with artificial intelligence is two areas. One, thinking about unstructured data. 
So extracting text from emails, translating handwriting to digital text, uh, determining whether a customer is, is frustrated or angry or pleased, or um, uh, so the emotional con content, and, and translating photos and images into interpreting them in, into what it is and what you should act on. So um, for example, we're doing a project for, we did a project for the NHS where we take handwritten forms filled out by doctors, we extract the doctor's handwriting, run it through, uh, in this case, Microsoft Cognitive Analytics, get back some digital text, and then our robot types the data into the National Transplant Database. The second is we're using pattern logic. This is usually when you have large volumes of data. Um, if you've got lots of different formats of documents and the, the robot doesn't know where to look on it because every one is different, that's a good place where you could use AI because you can use the pattern uh, uh, the machine learning aspect of, of AI. And also where you've got different document types and it needs to determine, hey, this one's an invoice out of a pile of you know, may, maybe 100,000 uh, 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 documents that may be for different purposes. And then finally, if you, if you really want to build intelligence in, because the RPA, uh, UiPath RPA platform is pre-integrated with all the leading AI vendors, you could use RPA as the hands, AI as the brains. You could use something, use the AI platform, for example, to decide what's the next activity I should take with someone who's a, 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 a very delinquent payer. What's the next activity I should take with somebody who needs care, but it's a very complex situation, but we want to deal with it in a standard way. So you can start to build that into that, that uh, learning into your AI engine and have your robot go and execute it by updating your, your IT systems. Next, please. And the final thing uh, on this is you might want to complement with workflow, particularly where you have very long and complex processes with lots of handoffs or where you've got long delays in your process. Um, uh, the UiPath suite is, is, continues to evolve and now includes many of these workflow aspects. So you don't even need to lead the tool. You just might need to use a different part of the platform. Next, please. Um, and the final lessons learned, and I think this picks up on the, on the a very valid point that Ian was raising about insights. Uh, mind that audit log for all it's worth. So RPA, it gives you a, a, a really useful asset that's quite off, we find is quite often overlooked and not planned for. That's the audit log that comes out. The audit log, because the robot quite often is touching multiple IT system, you get a view of the, the actual data that's processed across those different IT systems or just the activities that were performed. From that, you can in, uh, measure the benefits that you're actually delivering. So up front, you said you were going to deliver X. Are you delivering X? And how frequently are you delivering it? Is it standard per month or are there seasonal uh, uh, variances between, between the benefits. So you can get some real facts and figures to, to uh, support your change management and to drive more uh, RPA programs forward. And the other is to, to deal with more uh, scenarios. So you might, so typically you'll have a human involved when things don't go as planned or when we get unexpected data through, you can start to map those conditions out and build that into, into the robot. So we expect that you're aware of most of these points. We really just wanted to highlight these lessons learned, which are, which are meant as you know, gentle reminders. And, and we, we hope the reminders have been useful. Um, please join us next week when Rocco Labellarte will share his experience implementing RPA with Oxford City Council. Um, he's just starting out his program. He's in the earlier stage and he's taken a really interesting approach where they're planning to use RPA to backfill for normal attrition and to support the replacement of many of their IT systems. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Um, Ian here again. We have a uh, few minutes for some uh, questions that have been raised. Um, so I'm going to open the panel to, uh, we're going to have Linda uh, from Decorum, Keith from T-Impact, and Stephen from UiPath. Um, I have a couple of, a number of questions here. And Linda, not surprisingly, many of the questions are focused at yourself. The first question I've got is, how did you prioritize the proof of concepts? Um, what we did was uh, basically uh, using uh, our partners TA Impact, we run an, a number of sessions where we um, asked people to think about potentially uh, what areas they had were um, available for automation. So it started off with a, um, a kind of like a, a demo type thing where people got an idea of what could be done. 
We then gave them um, some time to go away and think about it and then asked them to come back with their ones that they'd like to consider. We then ran a session where we uh, got everybody to explain what they were and we asked people to effectively um, kind of vote as to what, um, what ones we thought we should do sooner rather than later. Um, so it was done in consultation with uh, key sort of representatives of the business um, uh, and so that we got a common agreement as to what was the way we were going to go about doing it. Okay, thank you for that, very interesting. I have a question which is like almost an extension of that. Um, we're about to undertake a corporate-wide opportunity scan for digital customer efficiency opportunities. Any advice on how to help services to identify potential opportunities around RPA? What are the best questions to ask and how, how to help people see the potential, etc.? So I suppose that's you again, Linda, but maybe a bit of Keith as well. Yeah, I think, um, again, it was, it was really about working with our partners, Keith and, and others in his team, because the first thing was to actually educate people as to what the, what the potential was, um, and then follow that up with um, asking them to bring forward examples and having this sort of like open workshop where we went through. I don't know, Keith, if you want to add to that. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, so the, the four things that we really look at when we're assessing uh, opportunities for a roadmap like this is, uh, is it suitable for robotics? Uh, you know, so of course, if it's not suitable, we might need a bit of preparation work before going forward. Um, the net benefits, so what the cost and what the benefits are likely to get, and this is just at a rough order of mag magnitude. Um, and, and the change appetite, you know, is are we delivering into an organization that's gonna welcome the change or they already run off their feet with other initiatives and it may be a great idea, but you know, we can never spare any resources to get it done. So, so those are the things we tend to, tend to focus on. Um, I think it's also probably worth um, Ian or, 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 or uh, some, somebody from uh, one of your team in uh, just mentioning Automation Hub and the capability you get with the tooling to very quickly um, federate some of the data gathering and some of the information sharing. Indeed, thank you. I'm gonna pass that over to Stephen. Hi all. So, um, so UiPath have a number of tool sets that help throughout the journey in terms of identifying the processes. One of those tools, as um, Keith has already mentioned, is Automation Hub. Automation Hub is, um, is a tool that is managed centrally, but is sent out in terms of, uh, in terms of profiling the RPA project. So people can put ideas onto Automation Hub. It then also puts it together a business case, which allows you to then rank the RPA projects in terms of, is it a good one because there's lots of repetitiveness involved, or is it a good one because actually it saves a lot of time or a lot of money and resource? Okay, thank you, thank you for that. And just on that, uh, I've got, I think we've got time for two more questions. One of them is actually extending that, which is part of the whole hyper automation uh, landscape that I discussed earlier. In hyper automation, do I need to buy it all at once? What elements do I need to start with? And Stephen, I'm going to leave that with with you again. Thanks. Okay. So for um, for your RPA journey, the the whole idea is that you can scale, so you don't necessarily need to make a huge investment on on day one, as um, as Linda's as Linda's um, suggested. The idea is that you've done your proof of concepts. Um, from that, you can then scale out after proving the business case and you can use tools such as the automation hub, which is the starting point. And then as you, you go through it, you obviously look at um, different types of bots and robots, depending upon the requirement of the automation. And that then takes you straight through to, um, to Insights, which is a tool set that you can be used to actually validate the information that you started off. So you've built the RPA project around a certain number of assumptions and then at the end of it you can then look back and see if those assumptions are correct. So, the, the, so I guess what I'm coming back to is it's very very scalable um, and in conversations with uh, with T Impact and ourselves we can help uh, we can help that scalability. To himself off mute. Okay, thank you for that. I've got one question here, sorry for Keith, and it's just, again, it's, they're all linked really, and that is, 
how quickly can we deploy RPA solutions? So as a rule of, um, you know, of course, it's, it, it depends on the complexity of the process and availability of staff, but the rule of thumb that we use is uh, a, a couple of weeks to understand the process and then six weeks for, for delivery. So you're, you're generally looking, you know, for very small process. It could be, it literally could be days. I think for Decorum, we built uh, one process. We, we, you know, from, from getting the go ahead to start, we built one process in five days. We had access to people. We worked in a very iterative manner. Great support. You know, we, we managed to get up and running. But traditionally, you know, we, we would say allow yourself, you know, six, six to nine weeks, um, particularly for your first projects where you might have to, you know, deal with a little bit of infrastructure or firewalls. Um, and, and then uh, um, uh, that, that's a safe bet for you. Okay, thank you, thank you. And you talked about there getting by and stuff like that. So for Linda, I've got a question. What challenges have you had internally to manage the central approach to RPA? Um, I can actually say I've not really had many challenges at all because we've done it in a very open and sort of transparent way. I think the, the key thing that we've done is rather than focus on um, uh, as this is a, w a way to cut staff um, and cut people's jobs. It's more about, I've, I've used the efficiency argument because um, it's about making the people that you've got more efficient so that your productivity improves. Because um, when um, RPA is used effectively, it can, it can do that but it's usually um, a small amount of, of lots of people and to therefore to try to equate that with a whole post to take out a post to make savings doesn't really work. But what we can see is there are some really big cost avoidance um, issues that you can uh, deliver on uh, and that's about improving accuracy, particularly with casework and anything that's got any kind of legal change. But really, it's about um, giving people back time to do the bits of the job that they really want to do and the value adding piece of things. But in terms of challenge, everyone so far has been supportive of it. Okay. Oh, good. That's good. That's good. Thank you for that. And I think last question, and I'm just going to throw it out there to the panel. If you can make one suggestion to councils just starting their RPA journey, what would it be? So who wants to jump in on that first? Uh, I'll be very bold. Uh, get some advice before you issue an RFP on G Cloud. <laughs> so quite quite often, the you know the tenders that come up, come across in, in G G Cloud are structured in such a way that you can't act, you're not actually going to get the best support from the vendors uh, uh, out there. So if you can get a little bit of advice just to help you understand what you should and shouldn't be considering when when buying services, it'll probably help. Um, and and the other thing that I would suggest is. Uh, get a partner to help you to identify which processes to, to implement. Because if you don't understand RPA, you might choose the wrong one, and then you're kind of boxed in a little bit once, you, once you've uh, gone through a public procurement portal. Thank you, thanks. Linda, would you add anything to that? What, if you could make one suggestion to councils just starting their RPA journey, what would it be? Yeah, I think there's two, two components. One is, I think, having a, a one program rather than lots of competing programs is important uh, because you end up getting um, the whole area of it further in future development and support. So it's important to have a, a common tool set. Uh, and if you do that through a tendering process, really make that process work for you to select a partner that can help you through the journey that understands you and can work in your particular environment. Um, and uh, if you don't get that, then it's really mirroring what Keith has just said that you might pick the wrong things to automate. Okay, and Stephen, I'm gonna throw the last one, the same question at you, last comment, please. Yeah, I, I would say talk to other councils. So you've got a great network in terms of uh, councils that already started their RPA journey. Lots are in different, um, stages of that journey just talk to them I mean uh, we other partners you've obviously got Linda's um, um, details as well are all willing to just give you some advice in terms of where your next step should be so yeah just reach out to to other councils and start those conversations okay thank you very much thank you very much that's as running out of time now so uh, I'd like to thank uh, certainly thank Linda uh, for your time very interesting very uh, useful um, Keith, T-Impact, um, 
Stephen for being on the um, panel. Uh, thank you all for attending. I hope you all found it useful. On the screen, you will see some contact details should you want to know any further uh, information. Um, the next, uh, as Keith has already said, the next uh, webinar is this time next week when Rocco from Oxford City Council is going to talk about their RPA journey. But in the meantime, I would again like to thank you for attending. Um, please reach out if you have any questions or issue, you know, or you want further information at all, uh, and stay safe. Thanks very much. Bye for now.